And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Christine Dorsey, who during her near-death experience saw her own tree of life and was ministered gifts she would then grow into as an adult. Christine, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we're excited to have you. And if you don't mind, let's start on the day that this NDE happened and go from there. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to start a little bit prior. Um, uh, I was in kindergarten and I was in Catholic school and I had a terrible stomach ache on a Friday afternoon, came home, uh, was violently ill all day the next day, Saturday, same thing, just really sick. That night, My parents took me to an area hospital called St. John's. We lived in Queens, New York, which is where I'm from originally. And I remember going into a very crowded ER and the doctor gave me this horrific green medicine. Um, And the reason I remember that is because when we came home, I proceeded to vomit the green medicine all over the couch. Um... I felt really horrible the entire night. Everything really just got worse. Um, And I can tell you, I vividly remember almost every aspect of this event to the point where the next morning, which was a Sunday morning, I sat up in the living room and screamed because what was happening was my appendix was bursting in that moment in the house. Um... At that point, you know, my mom and my dad were just, you know, horrified. And uh, I always tell the story. My dad is a hundred was a hundred percent Sicilian with a very a little man with a, a big personality. We'll call it that. Uh, very upset, very aggravated. He had also suffered from appendicitis at the age of seven, I believe. He had had told us, and he was sure that that's what it was. They then. Um, wrapped me up in a lovely 70s colored afghan that my mother had knitted we went into the volkswagen bug and i remember going right to elmhurst general which was a different hospital i remember getting into the er and at some point ending up on a gurney and looking up at what to me looked like a doctor he could have been a nurse, he, I'm not sure who he was, but having this overwhelming feeling that everything was going to be okay. And at that point, I was rushed into surgery. So what had occurred was my appendix had burst and I had gone septic. So uh, it's pretty much a recipe for disaster for anybody, let alone, you know, a five and a half year old child. The next thing I remember is being in heaven. I do not remember what people call the wormhole in or the wormhole out. And what I've come to understand later on is that the reason I don't remember that is because at five and a half, that was terrifying to me. And so my mind sort of shut that part down because what I was to remember was the actual event itself. And what I saw was nothing short of absolutely stunning. I was standing there staring at the most gorgeous field of tulips of every color you could imagine. And the colors vibrated. Uh, That's just the best word I have. It's almost like they were singing. And I don't recall at that age truly seeing a tulip flower because my mom grew rose bushes. So uh, this seemed like a different kind of a flower. And it was all that I saw. It, if I, it was just rolling hills, if I were to say it was acres of just tulips. And I was up on a bit of a hill and I was staring down at all of these tulips that were very tall because I was very small. And standing in front of me with his back to me was a man. Um, He had on a robe 
with what appeared to be like a hemp type of belt, no shoes. I also had no shoes on. I remember that because of the dirt on the ground. I could see the dirt path. And the way I would describe this man is he had a really bad haircut that his mommy didn't cut his hair the right way because at five and a half, it, life is simple. So my observations were very simple. Um, all I saw was the back of him. And he started to walk and I understood that I should walk and follow him. I can tell you in that instant, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't scared. I wasn't cold. I wasn't concerned. I was completely happy where I was and happy to follow him on this path. I then followed him down this slight hill that I talked about. And when I looked over to my left, I remember seeing the sun, almost like I called the perfect sun, the setting sun, like between 4.30 and 5.30, where it's still brilliant, but it's not too hot. It's just lovely. And it was over to the left. And we walked down the path and went a little to the right. And now we were walking no longer down a hill. And what was in front of me was the most magnificent, gorgeous tree. And when I looked at it, and I remember thinking, this is the best tree that you could climb. As a little kid, I thought, oh my goodness, like the branches were low and it seemed absolutely perfect. Um, I'm not an expert on trees. And I remember a big tree in front of our house growing up. And I remember vividly thinking, I've never seen a tree like this. And upon reflection as an adult, I understand that that's what the tree of life images look like, very much so. So we stood in front of the tree and he turned to look at me and I knew it wasn't Christ, but I knew he was someone special. Um, he had green eyes like I do. He had these gold, beautiful flecks almost in his eyes, like a sparkle. Um, this sandy brown hair, again, looked uneven, kind of a wavy look. Uh, facial hair on his face. Kind energy, a kind face. Again, no fear at all. Really just completely happy to be there. And he grabbed a very big book. And the book was interesting because, you know, again, I'm going to go back to being a little kid. When you remember books, they're just all, you know, little hardcover books. And back in the 70s, I'm dating myself, but, you know, even paper, hardcover books. And this was a very thick book. All of the pages were very uneven and it was bound almost by fabric. I couldn't figure out. It was very different. But he took this book and he sort of flipped the pages so it creates a little bit of a fan. And he created just a little fan into my face so that I, I giggled and I laughed. And he said, you two will know this book one day. And I just smiled at him. Again, sort of not really realizing in that moment what he meant, but receiving all of it. He then took my hand and we walked over to this little stream. And all of the rocks were very well-rounded, like an old stream that had been there for a long time. And I just remember holding his hand, looking at the water and looking at the stream. And the next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital. I was in ICU for 12 days in the hospital, total of 17 days. So it was um, a pretty serious event. When I got out of the hospital, I remember just being very depressed, uh, not happy at all, didn't want to be here, couldn't really explain my emotions because at five and a half, it's a little strange to, to try to understand why you're feeling so depressed to be alive and to be home, you know. I should be happy I'm back home, but I did not really feel that at the time. Um, I did try to tell 
my parents what happened, but you know, in an all fairness back then, um, they thought I was a little kid who was on a lot of pain medication and, you know, didn't really hear what I was saying. They maybe heard it, but didn't take it so seriously. And also transparency in terms of hospitals wasn't the same. You just didn't get the details because I had many times asked my mom, you know, did the hospital ever explain that there was something that went wrong, that they had lost me for a temporary period of time? And and she said, no, you know, I, I know they never said that to me, but we, we all understood that something strange happened, you know, something different happened because when I, like I said, came home, I was very depressed. I then um, was going to sit for my uh, kindergarten graduation. And, you know, I would say the proof is in the pudding. And so there's a picture that I had actually sent you, which was me at five and a half and the photographer trying to get me to smile. And I, I distinctly remember her saying, you know, why won't you smile? Like, why, what is it that a little five-year-old won't smile about? And that whatever... I could muster up is in that photo was the best smile I could give. And that's really, you know, how I felt for quite some time. Um, at that point, then, what I would say is I compartmentalized the experience because, you know, I was here now. I was, you know, living. So I took the experience and I put it in the back of my mind and I grew up as a kid. And what I think was one of the best things that happened is my parents moved out of the city to the Hudson Valley, which is a suburban area about an hour and 10 minutes north of the city. It took me out of the Catholic school system and took me into public school system. I do believe everything happens for a reason. And part of this was going to assist me in my own spiritual journey because I, although my experience may seem religious, beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's very spiritual. And I am very spiritual versus religious. So, you know, I'm growing up, I get into my 20s. And then these gifts that I, I was ministered in this experience, the tree that I was shown, the book that was shown to me. Now what's starting to happen is my intuition is really waking up, always had a really good intuition, became very curious about angels and archangels and manifesting and energy of crystals and different beliefs, yoga and meditation and understanding energy and the power of that. When I became a little bit older, around my mid thirties, that memory that I had compartmentalized came to the forefront. And now I'm realizing that here I'm an adult and I have all of these spiritual interests. I have these gifts that are starting to awaken and I'm starting to find like-minded people and almost like a tribe, like when they say you find your, your tribe. I found teachers, I found mentors. Um, and one of the mentors, or I should say I came into contact with, was a really wonderful medium out of Connecticut. And when I was in the session with her, we were talking about the experience. And, and, uh, and I should say what, what I started to do was mention the experience, like as a minute sort of piece of information I gave her. But I wanted to hear if she could expand on it. And she absolutely expanded on everything to the point where she understood who the person was who was with me as being John, Jesus's cousin, who's John the Baptist. And that made total sense to me. I really felt it in every core of my body that this was resonating perfectly. So as more confirmation to this fact, Right after I had seen her, because it was around Christmas time, I go into the city in, in New York City uh, around Christmas, as most people in the area do. And as part of going down Fifth Avenue, we'll sort of peek in at St. Patrick, Patrick's Cathedral. It is beautiful and ornate, and it's lovely. And 
But at Christmas time, it's always packed. I mean, shoulder to shoulder, you you can get into the entryway and that's probably usually as far as you can go. Well, this particular time, two weeks before Christmas, we went in and it wasn't crowded at all, which in and of itself, that was a big shock. We actually sat down in a pew just to sort of like sit in it and just feel the energy of the church and just kind of look around. And I said, you know, why don't we... Why don't we just walk the stations of the cross? I mean, I've never done that here. I probably won't ever do that because, you know, the chances of getting in around Christmas time again, I would believe are slim. So we did, and it was pretty magnificent. They were ornate. They were beautiful. We walked all the stations, a very big cathedral, and you get to the back of the church, and I've never seen that behind the altar is a shrine to Mary. And I went, Oh, this is it was gorgeous, really stunning. So we just kind of like looked at that. It was very quiet. And there's one more station hiding in the corner, one statue by itself. No one is there. And again, it's two weeks before Christmas. This is mind blowing to me. And I knew I was supposed to step further and look at this. Well, I went in and it was a statue of Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the mother of John. And carved into a, a little saying right there in the statue was the story of how Archangel Gabriel came to her and told her she would give birth to a child late in life because the story goes she was older when she had John and he would baptize the son of God and every hair stood up in my body it was just more confirmation and, it, and I just felt like it was Elizabeth saying yes it was my son. That was him. Yes. You, you know, it's everything now is coming to a culmination. That was your experience. So I then, you know, leave and I'm, I'm now in my, in my working life, what I was doing at the same time was I was working with clients and I had a clinic and it was a health related cl uh, clinic that I had. And what I was beginning to notice with my clients was that we would have these very quick appointments and we would talk about what was going on for them, how they were eating that week, you know, any stressors and you know, just kind of sort of, sort of like all around sort of health and associated with food and weight loss at that time. And I always had a great rapport and a great clientele. And if I should happen to miss an appointment, because one of my children had a game and I had someone come in and substitute for me, the clients would get very, very, very upset. And I started to notice this connection. And then they would give me feedback over time. And they would say, again, it's a 15 minute appointment. So they would say, you know what? I always just feel better being with you. I could sit here and tell you what went on this week. And I walk out of here and something is different. And I started to really pay attention to that. In addition with growing with my studies of spirituality, again, connecting with mentors, I then expanded into more of a wellness practice, looking at the whole person and spirituality being a component of that. And I started to dive deeper into how important that was in that sort of pie chart of life. If we're going to look at the circle of life, although spirituality may be one piece, how really truly important that piece was. And then over time, I stepped further into my healing gifts and studied to become a Reiki master, integrated energy therapy at the advanced level, certified meditation teacher, ordained minister. I do work with tarot and, and oracle cards just as a tool. And this has cultivated even more of the healing practice, which is what I focus on now. And it is absolutely one of the wonder, most wonderful gifts I received from my experience. And when I stepped into that beautiful tulip field and stared at this gorgeous tree, I understood that tree to be my tree of life. And he was showing me 
this is how full your tree is. Your tree will be, you know, it's strong, it's purposeful, it's bountiful. And, and I really feel that that's what I've, I've become is sort of a product of my purpose here and what my focus is. So when I'm doing healing, you know, I, yes, I'm attuned to the Reiki symbols and the IET symbols, but, you know, we're really bringing spirit in, in a big way. We're bringing the angels in, in a big way. And what I'm able to see as a gift is the traumas, the stories that are stuck in people's bodies. Um, and we're able to move that energy out. It takes sometimes a few sessions, but the point is that's a gift that I have. The other gift I have um, is deceased family members will step in at times. And I put a lot of protection around us during our healing sessions. But if it's in the client's highest good, we bring those messages through. Um, and and I do believe that that's directly related to my experience. Um, you know, I, I have a very wonderful mentor who who told me, you know, Christine, you have the ethereal flag up now. You know, they know. <laughs> Everybody knows. <laughs> so, so when that happens, sometimes spirits will want to come and communicate or explain something. And sometimes it's not okay. And so we do some tools and grounding. And I personally do a lot of grounding and tools and protection so that it can only happen when I give it permission. But outside of that, it's been absolutely a wonderful opportunity. And I feel really blessed to and privileged really to be able to help people in that healing manner. And in a lot of ways, when I think back to the experience and I look at who John was, you know, John is a, a supporting cast member to Christ, right? He's, he's in the background, but so important. And I feel that I'm very similar in that way with my clients. I'm a supporting cast member to them. I want them to flourish. I want them to heal and do well. And I'm there to do anything I can to help them. And in my mind, there's absolutely no accidents or coincidences in why this happened, uh, not only to me, but really for me. And that's my story. Christine, thank you for sharing your story with us. I'm going to ask you a few biblical questions because I'm not up to speed on that. Was Elizabeth Mother Mary's sister? Oh, you know, no, I think, I think it was her cousin. I think they were actually cousins. Was I think they were cousins. And then, so they were second cousins. If I remember it correctly, what, it could be wrong. Was John the Baptist also from a virgin birth? So I don't believe he was from a virgin birth. I believe the story goes that Elizabeth was considered barren and couldn't have kids. So I think she was trying. Do we know exactly the details? No, but I believe that's that's the background story. So they are cousins, um, but that was his purpose in life. I'm not saying you're wrong. It just, yeah. what came to mind was a guest told me that the Virgin Mary's sister also had a child via virgin hmm. birth. Yeah. Wow. So, I, I'm not, again, I'm not religious. So your guess might be a little more accurate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You also mentioned that John had a book. Mm -hmm. What was that book of? So I believe it's the book of spirit. It's the book of spirit that I'm going to be telling. It's explaining God, spirituality, everything that I will know and I will share. That was a book that was for me. And that's why I was going to know this book someday. That's you my belief. Do you think it's like a physical book at some point that you will, you know, have your hands on? Or is it kind of a metaphorical book of your life? I feel it's a metaphorical book. I, if I, I can't imagine that I'd have my hands on it, but if I do, I mean, it, it was, it was like something I had never seen before. And only as an adult, when I recall what I saw, can I understand, I'm assuming in those times, that may be what a book looked like. That may be very common to be what a book looked like. Um, 
but I do believe that that book is metaphorical mostly for me and my purpose in life. I wonder, I'm just reaching here, but I wonder if it even is a book that could be about you in the Akashic Records. Yeah, it could be, yeah. At some point you may have the ability to see it there. Yeah, that's true. There's still time, absolutely. I'm open. Seeing the tree, I guess you could basically say that you were seeing your future. Yeah, I think I was seeing each branch to me was representing a different stage in my spiritual evolution. And eventually what what it was is to become, because I believe I'm still evolving, obviously, is this strong, bountiful, purposeful, beautiful tree. And so I do agree with you. I think that, that that's very much what it was. Are there any elements of the tree that you can look back now and say, oh, well, that represented this thing in my life? I think if I were to look back at the, the beginning branches, sort of those low-lying ones that I thought I could climb easily, I think that they would be climbing out of the area, climbing out of Catholic school, no offense to the Catholics, climbing into an opportunity to grow my spirituality by coming into the area that we then moved to. That was a pretty drastic move back then, but very purposeful and for sure instrumental in my path. Um, it seemed that the, the larger branches became fuller. You know, there were more leaves up top. And I just think that's stepping into my spirituality even more, which is mostly, like I said, sort of like, you know, mid to late 30s till now is, you know, it's it's who I am. It, it This is fuller. It, this is my life. This is, you know, this is how I roll. You know, there's no other version of me. This is me. Yeah. Some people may say that seeing John the Baptist will make it appear to be a religious-based NDE, but mm -hmm. you're saying it's not. It was spiritual. Can you talk you know, a little I, bit more about how you separate the two? I think, in my mind, what religion has done in a lot of ways at times, it's created these boundaries and borders around a belief, you know, and... And again, this is my opinion. I think if we look at who Christ was, you know, he was a rebel in his time. You know, he was going door to door to people's homes and in spaces, talking about what he felt was important, you know, talking about being a good person, doing good. And, and then over time, as we know, what's happened is religion has taken it and turned it into many different things. It's created wars over it. It's, Never the intention was never the intention. So that's why I say, you know, it's not religious. I'm not saying that he wasn't part of that time. He absolutely was. But I like to refer to it as spiritual. I like to give it a nice, beautiful, general experience because it's for everybody. It's not for one religion. It's just my experience. It was spiritual and it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience for everybody. I don't want to segregate into religions. I don't believe in that. I know you were only five, but at the time, is it possible you had some even little gift that you were kind of barely aware of, but didn't really know how to use it? Um, I would say when I reflect back, I always had a very good intuition and I always had um, nightmares. So I, I tend to think that maybe I was seeing things quite often, but thinking they were dreams. And when I say things, I mean people who have crossed over. Um, and I have certainly read a lot about that, that that happens with people sort of once they, they cross the veil and come back, it, you know, you have that ability to see that. Um, I do think that that might have been the case. And then I shut it down because, you know, once we get to sort of the age seven and eight, we can sort of like just start to close it up a little bit. Um, but the intuition part has always has always been there. And I do also believe that maturation was a big key. So I had to get to a certain stage and age in my life 
when these gifts were ready to become fruitful. You know, I sort of have turned it as like, I feel like seeds were planted back then and they were dormant for a while, waiting, waiting, waiting until it was time to grow. Um, incidentally, I'm just going to jump back to the tulips. I then looked up the spiritual meaning of the tulip because I was trying to understand why they were so significant. And in one of the definitions I found, it was like pure and perfect love was the definition of a tulip. And of course, of course, it's pure and perfect love to be in that, that space and in that energy and in that realm. Have the memories of the experience faded over time? No, actually the, the opposite. They're very vivid. And I've been told that uh, more will come. And I, I think that, again, has to go with the maturation. You know, like the more I'm mature and ready, the more I will then step into more of the memory of it. But I never, it's its extremely vivid. It's really extremely vivid. Um, so I'm grateful for that. It never leaves. It just never leaves. Yeah. Is it something that you find yourself thinking about it every day? Um, I don't think about it every day, but I do feel very connected to spirit. So I do feel that every day I have a certain routine, we'll call it. And it's sort of my, my grounding and my life force. And it brings me solace and it's, a combination of meditation and prayer um, that works for me. So in a way, it has really created this stronghold to the spirit world, myself to the spirit. Yeah. Since your experience, have you seen John again, even if it's only been in a dream? Uh, I have not seen him, but I have felt him. And um the way it has happened, which is very interesting, is uh, it's like my heart rate picks up very quickly and then I, I get goosebumps and it starts at the bottom of my legs and on the way up. And he'll put a thought in my head. Um, just one example was that um, I was trying to think of a book that I was going to share with a client. And I couldn't really decide on on this particular book that I wanted to share the information with. And all of a sudden, it was very powerful and direct of like, this is the book. And the funny thing was, is I, I sort of went around the house and I looked in a couple of cabinets and it was like a book hiding underneath a whole bunch of other books that I hadn't seen in years. And it was like, this is the book. And I, I looked at the book and I was like, oh yeah, this is the perfect book. You know, it's so that's an example of like feelings I'll get. It, it doesn't happen all that often, but, but I feel that he's very much present when needs to be, you know, and uh, will come through that way. So that's been really pretty incredible. Yeah. Do you fear death at all? Um, I don't fear death. I think I, I understand grief though. You know, I have a lot of clients who are dealing with grief. So I'm not flippant about that powerful emotion associated with death. I do know, I know what's waiting, but I understand our human process here that we have to go through. So I'm very respectful of the entire process. Well, when people that you know are grieving, mm -hmm. especially over the loss of loved ones, yes, what kind of advice do you give? So typically with my clients who are grieving, we will do energy work. Uh, that in and of itself really alleviates a lot of grief. When they come to and if their loved one has come in with a message for them, something I would never know that only they would know that moment is so healing because it could be a joke. It could be something simple, like talking about something they ate for dinner last week, just to know that their loved one is there with them is also so tremendously healing. And I acknowledge their grief. I never 
I never want to take that away because I understand that it's their process. But I also encourage them to step into their spirituality more, to talk to their loved ones, understand they're right there, keep doing the work that we're doing. And eventually, and I've seen this, they want to evolve out of their grief in a different way. Because, you know, especially I, I've worked with a lot of parents who have lost children. I mean, that's a level of grief, you know, that's just incredibly terrible. And so that never goes away, that hole in the heart. But what they are able to do is create a life around the hole and evolve with that. And that's beautiful. And, you know, if I can assist in helping them with that, then I'm, that's I'm doing my job. You know, when you do get messages from people on the other side, do you are you clairaudient and hear their voice or do you just kind of get like a downloaded message that kind of comes to you? It's more like a downloaded message. So they'll show me in my mind's eye a image and express the thought. Uh, I don't quite hear the sounds. Um, I will get feelings. And it, it, it depends on the person. So um, kids are really easy to come through, which is beautiful. And they're really clear with their communication. Um, the older people are, depends on the experiences the person had with the client and whether they feel comfortable enough to come forth. And sometimes it's not in the highest good of my client for them to come forth in the healing session. Sometimes it's just knowing the presence is there. But I've had, um, I had a client who was in her sixties and her dad came through once and specifically had a message. You know, I knew none of what I'm about to tell you about her thinking about moving. And it was nothing I knew about totally relocating and moving. And he came through and showed me a scene of how he looked when she was alive in their kitchen, where he would sit at the kitchen table and the way he talked. And it was exactly what she needed. And it was so healing. And so, you know, sometimes that's the way they can come through. So I don't know it's, it's, you know, it doesn't always happen because again, I'm very strict with the healing sessions and I, it's only for the highest good of the client. And um, that's the focus is healing. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Are you open to that? And if so, how can they contact you? Sure. So I have a website. It's Heliotrope. Heliotrope is H-E-L-I-O-T-R-O-P-E. -E. It's a Greek word. So it means a flower that follows the sun. So it's heliotropeholistichealing.com. Um, there's a contact button that leads you to my email, Christine at heliotropeholistichealing.com. So you know, I do um, virtual healings. I do Zoom sessions. I do you know many different uh, varieties. Uh, that is my focus, my purpose, and my goal is to help heal and to help people um, you know find their own peace at whatever level they're able to do. Well, before we finish up. Can you give us one last positive message? Uh, I really want to give people hope for them to understand that when you cross over, that there is just this bountiful, beautiful existence realm that's there for us. Um, and that healing while we're alive is extremely important. And if we can do even a little bit of healing at a time, that our lives would be so much richer and fuller. And it is hard to heal, but, you know, there's help. There's always help. So I hope that I've, uh, I've passed that on. I hope that people can feel like there's hope and there's definitely help for healing. Christine, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.